Hello, and welcome to part 12 of the Unsolved Mysteries Mega Iceberg Explained. Tonight, we start our descent into the bottom of layer 4, so put on your heart-shaped sunglasses, cause we gonna take a ride. Pumina. The Pumina is an alleged giant snake that has been spotted a few times in the western Katanga regions of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, especially near Lake Upemba. The snake resembled that of an African rock python, which are usually sized between 10 to 16 feet long, but this snake is said to be between 38 to 46 feet long, with a head estimated to be about 2.5 feet. The snake, if real, would be the largest python ever spotted. Even as far back as the 19th century, Mary Kingsley, who was an English ethnographer, would record that she had been, quote, assured by the missionaries in Calabar that there was a python brought into Creek Town in Reverend Mr. Goldie's time that extended the whole length of the Creek Town Mission House veranda and to spare. This python must have been over 40 feet. I have not a shadow of doubt it was, end quote. But that's not even the oldest recorded sighting. Going back to the 3rd century BC, the general Marcus Atilius Regulus would remark upon reaching the river by Gratus that once the battalions went across the river, an enormous snake rose up from the reed beds. It had a flattened head and glowing lantern-like eyes that stared at them. They estimated that the snake was close to 100 feet, so the Romans decided to move downstream to cross, but the snake followed them, and then it struck and seized the soldier into its jaws, crushing the man before drowning him, and supposedly it would strike each time another soldier tried to cross. The general ordered the catapults to hurl immense rocks at the creature. Once it was wounded and tried to flee, a stone would hit the leviathan between the eyes, shattering its skull. The soldier would pull it ashore and skin it, and it measured to 121 feet. The skin would remain on display in a temple in Rome until 133 BC, where it was eventually lost. The snake, if real, has long thought to be the same type of snake as Pumina, an African rock python. However, the most famous sighting of this snake comes in August 1959, when Belgian pilot Remy Van Leerd claimed to have seen the enormous snake while flying over Katanga. Quote, as we had a camera on board, I decided to make several passes over the hole where the snake was in, and able to let the man take a picture of it, and I made certainly between four and six passes right over the hole where the snake was in. By then I was already flying for 25 years, so I have a very good experience of measuring things, and I would say the snake I saw there was close to 50 foot." End quote. The mechanic on board was able to take a photo, which you can see here. It's somewhat of a surprise that although there are multiple alleged sightings of gigantic snakes, and I'm talking 40 feet plus, there has never been any solid proof presented. We do know the official record is close to 33 feet, and that one was shot on the north coast of Sulawesi in 1912. But other than that, there's no tangible proof of this snake. So does Pumina exist? Or are people just bad at estimating sizes? Queen's Jane Doe. This is one of those where there's barely any info. Even the link from the iceberg takes you to a now deleted page on unidentified wiki. The little info that I could find indicates that on February 5th, 1994, the remains of a young woman were found behind a power plant in Queens, New York. It was established the body had been there for several months and belonged to an African-American teen between the ages of 16 and 19 and between the heights of 5 foot 3 to 5 foot 5. She had long brown wavy hair. She had one scar on her knee. She was found wearing a brown leather jacket, blue jeans, and a purple long sleeve sweater. She was also wearing a dark colored Nike Air Jordan sneaker, and that's pretty much it. Like I said, not much about this one. Rachel Cook. On January 10th, 2002, Rachel Cook was visiting her parents in Georgetown, Texas. The 19-year-old was on winter vacation from her school at San Diego Mesa College, and it was around 8 a.m. that morning. Her mom, Janet, who was leaving for work, would see Rachel asleep on the couch. Sometime later, Rachel awoke. She would decide to go on her training run. Rachel had ran for the cross-country team in school and would take four-mile runs every morning. Her dad, Robert, would be home at 3 p.m., although some accounts say it was 5. He wasn't at first concerned because he thought she might have went with a friend named Shannon, who she had plans with that evening. But Robert would get worried and would eventually reach out to Shannon, who also had not seen her. He would then call a local restaurant named Wildfire, which is a place Rachel would sometimes pick up a shift when she was visiting. 
the person that answered the phone would alleviate all of Robert's worries when he confirmed that Rachel indeed was working a shift that evening. By the next morning, though, Robert would wake up and still, no sign of Rachel. He would once again call the restaurant back to find out when Rachel had left the previous night. To his shock, the employee would realize the mistake, for it was not Rachel Cook that had worked the previous night. Instead, it was a different Rachel. A sinking feeling now came over the Cook family. Her mom would spring into action, going to a local hospital to make sure that Rachel had not been checked in, while her dad would drive the four-mile route Rachel normally took. They knew that she had went for her jog, because the only thing missing was her running clothes and her Walkman. They would end up going to the Williams County Sheriff Department to make the official missing persons report at 2 p.m. Detectives would start retracing Rachel's day. It's then that they learned she had spoke to her boyfriend Greg at 9.15 a.m., who was still back in California. She would then leave for her run after this. It was 11 a.m. that a neighbor backing down his driveway seen Rachel run by. Then an elderly couple out walking seen her. Finally, one last witness, a man working on his property down the street from Rachel's home, would see her. She had made it to within 200 yards of her front door and somehow vanished in between. An extensive search would be carried out, finding nothing. Robert continued searching on the weekends for months, never finding a single clue. And sadly, not much has changed in 20 years, at least publicly anyways. There have been a few leads over the years, but nothing came from it. One early lead was an unidentified Native American or Hispanic male in his late teens or early 20s that was seen talking to a female jogger that morning, possibly even Rachel. He was driving a Pontiac Trans Am that was finally found in April 2018 and had had three previous owners. Testing was done on the car and the trunk did test positive for, quote, possible presence of blood, end quote. Yet, nothing else ever came from this. In 2006, convict Michael Keith Moore would confess to killing Rachel and dumping her body into the Gulf of Mexico. He was scheduled to plead guilty and then the day of, changed his mind, stunning his own lawyers. He would admit that he made the whole thing up to get preferential treatment in prison, mainly more visitation time with his wife. However, detectives were convinced that they had their man, and he is still one of several suspects. Another one of the main ones is that of her unnamed ex-boyfriend, who was very emotional at the time that Rachel broke up with him, and was even more upset when Rachel would not speak to him after she returned to town. Since then, this case seems to be at a standstill. Ray Rivera The case of Ray Rivera was probably a bit more obscure years ago, but the renewed Unsolved Mystery series that relaunched in 2020 would actually feature this case as their very first episode, and it brought a ton of publicity to it. But, just in case you haven't seen it, Ray was a 32-year-old writer who moved to Baltimore with his wife after accepting a job writing newsletters for Ray's longtime friend, Porter Stansbury, who owned a financial publishing company. Ray had only recently accepted the job after his filmmaking dreams started to stall. At some point, he would be moved up from writing newsletters to producing videos for Stansbury, but at some point, he would also step down from that. But on May 16, 2006, he received a call and in a hurry left his home, not saying where he was going, and he would never return. His family and wife would then launch a several day search for any sign of him. His wife's parents would eventually find his car parked near his former workplace. Ray's former co-workers would then go on top of the parking structure near where his car was discovered. It's here they observed something bizarre. They noticed a hole in the roof of the south wing of Belvedere Hotel, which now was made up largely of condos. When they went to where the hole was, they would find Ray's partially decomposed body. An investigation would begin and the Baltimore PD strangely concluded that Ray had committed suicide, even though there were some odd things about it. First of all, there was the considerable distance between the tower and the location of the hoe on the lower roof. The fall was about 177 feet and would have taken 3.3 seconds. This suggests that he would have had to travel a distance of 43 feet before impact, meaning he would have had to been running at almost a sprint to do so, which you would think would mean he was wearing tennis shoes yet he was wearing flip-flops. There were also other little clues in his life that would make most think that suicide could not be a possibility, such as Ray booking office space for the weekend after his disappearance, as well as the fact that he was recently married. Adding more confusion was the fact that Ray's glasses and phone were found mostly intact near the hoe on the lower roof. 
the medical examiner marked his manner of death as undetermined, also making this whole thing suspicious, was his friend Porter Stansbury, who allegedly told his employees not to talk to authorities. There's also the fact that the phone call for Ray came from Stansbury's company, yet no one has ever came forward and claimed to have been the caller, although Stansbury claims that call never came from that building, as his company was on retreat at the time at the Eastern Shores. He also said he was portrayed negatively on the Unsolved Mysteries episode. Back at Ray's home, a note was found that spoke about prominent figures in Hollywood, movie titles, Freemasonry quotes, and other ramblings. The FBI stated the note was not suicidal in spite of the fact that the Baltimore police still ruled his death as a suicide. Most theories now seem to be suicide, murder, some say by the Freemasons. Another claim was that Ray didn't jump from the roof at all, but was rather thrown from a helicopter, or was possibly even a hit-and-run victim. And a lot of people suspect his friend Porter Stansbury, whose company had already gotten into trouble once before, for fraud. However, the prosecutor's podcast received a letter from the lawyers of Porter Stansbury, in which claimed that there was some info that Unsolved Mysteries withheld to make the show more interesting, such as the fact that Ray had been displaying signs of paranoia for a while, and that Ray had visited the Belvedere roof on several occasions to watch the sun rise and sunset. Roanoke Colony. This is another one that I have to say. I'm a bit perplexed how it is so low down on this chart. It's one of the most famous mysteries in the world, and it has been for a few centuries now. So for that reason, I won't spend a lot of time on it. Roanoke was a colony founded in 1585 by Governor Ralph Lane in what is known now as Derry County, North Carolina. The colony was plagued by lack of supplies and poor relations with the local natives. Lane would abandon the colony in 1586 after waiting on a delayed resupply mission. Sir Richard Greenville would then arrive two weeks later and left a small detachment behind to protect Sir Walter Wally's land claim. After this first settlement failed, a second expedition would be established in 1587, this time led by John White, who was handpicked by Raleigh himself. In 1588, just a year after the second attempt, a ship captained by Simon Fernandez stopped at the colony to check in on the small detachment of men that had been left by Sir Richard Greenville in 1587. He and John White would then go back to England to get more supplies for the fledgling colony, but White was not able to return right away because of the Anglo-Spanish War. He would actually not be able to return to Roanoke for two more years until 1590, and when he arrived, he found the settlement fortified but abandoned. The word Croatoan was found carved on a palisade, which White took to mean that they had relocated to Croatoan Island. Before he could follow up on this lead though, rough seas and a lost anchor forced him to abandon the mission and return to England, and he never bothered to look for the 112 to 121 lost colonists again. And ever since then, there's been a ton of theories put forth to try and explain their disappearance. One of the earliest theories was actually proposed by Jamestown Colony, the first successful English colony in North America. Their investigation found that the Roanoke settlers had been massacred and that some of the survivors assimilated with Native American villages. However, they could not find any concrete proof for this, but those two are the most likely theories, though others have been proposed, such as the desperate colonists may have used a light boat that was left behind to try and cross the Atlantic back to England, only for it to sink and lose all hands on deck. Yet the ship that was left behind was too small to carry all of the colonists, so this theory is mostly ruled out. There's also the political conspiracy theory, where Sir Francis Walsingham, who was the Queen's principal secretary, had set out to sabotage Sir Walter Riley's colony from the start. Another interesting one is that the whole thing was a secret operation and they were never lost at all. Allegedly, Walter Riley had sent the colonists to harvest sassafras trees along the Alligator River and that England falsified all these records, including the bit about them being lost, in order to hide their operations from the Spanish, whom were also active near the area. And speaking of the Spanish, that's another common theory. Spanish records from the time period did know about the Virginia colony, and they were actively searching for it before White's colonists even arrived. At this time, Spain claimed most of North America, and they did not recognize England's right to colonize Roanoke. 
and considering the Spanish had sacked Fort Carolina in 1565, a French outpost in Florida, well, it's not hard to imagine they could have destroyed Roanoke too. However, Spanish records from that time state that they were still searching for the colony as late as 1600. This is just a small summary of this mystery, but I mean, come on, we've all heard this one before a dozen times. Robert Springfield. On September 19th, 2004, 48-year-old Robert Springfield and his 13-year-old son Colton and adopted son Brent Brooks decided to go to Black Canyon in Montana to hunt elk on the Crow Indian Reservation to whom they were members of. After a day of hunting, Robert's two sons would return to the prearranged meeting spot later that afternoon. They would wait for Robert up until dark, but he never arrived. They would leave and contact the Bighorn Sheriff's Department and other members of the tribe. When they had last seen Robert, he was wearing heavy winter clothing and was armed with a bow and arrow. A FLIR-equipped helicopter would fly over the area where they thought Robert would be, while the Bureau of Indian Affairs brought in sniffer dogs and horseback searchers, but they found nothing. And that would pretty much be the end of it for a while. Over a year, actually. In October 2005, a hunter in the Black Canyon area would hear a crow screeching, and normally, that wouldn't be that big of a deal out in the wild. But this bird was loud, and was screeching non-stop. Finally, this hunter would walk over to the tree where the crow was sitting, and down on the ground were human remains. Making this even stranger, was next to the partial skull and femur, was a neatly rolled up men's belt and a pair of boots. There was also a men's coat on the ground that had a small tear in the back, and a wallet with some money was also found, but the bow and arrows were missing. The sheriff and Bureau of Indian Affairs would look at the scene and then call the FBI because they suspected foul play, which was odd because why wasn't the wallet of money taken? Why was the belt and boots found neatly by the bones? No one knows, and the FBI couldn't really answer those questions either. In fact, the FBI would send the remains to Quantico for DNA testing and identification and kept them for two years before finally returning the remains to the family. And apparently, over that whole time frame, they never once reached out to the family. But when they finally did return the remains, the cause of death was listed as undetermined and the family also noticed that the several items in the wallet that were returned, like his ID and social security card, had no signs of weathering or water damage in spite of allegedly sitting outside for over a year. So you could see why the family believes he was taken and killed somewhere else and then disposed of in that location. But that's the family's theory. This is one of those super obscure ones that has become part of the 411 saga of David Pilates. Of course, he took a different route and only said something big must have happened on that mountain and the FBI was covering it up. There's a couple more well-grounded theories though, such as Robert simply got lost and then due to hypothermia, took his own clothes off, which is known as paradoxical undressing. Another theory is that he got hurt and he was using the rolled up belt as a tourniquet. Of course, that doesn't explain everything else. Robert's sister, Myra Venter, did an interview with the Billings Gazette and said that on the morning that he disappeared, gunshots were heard on the mountain and that once the body was recovered, an officer told the family that because of the hole in the back of Robert's jacket, he could have been shot and killed, and that's led to this theory that a hunter accidentally shot Robert and then panicked and hid the body only to bring it out of hiding a year later and put his remains out with his belongings folded neatly beside him so someone could find him and his family could get some closure. Of course, that's all speculation. All I can say for this one is this truly baffling. Rodney Marks Rodney Marks from Geelong, Victoria, Australia was an astrophysicist who in the late 90s was lucky enough to work at the South Pole Station in Antarctica, but it would turn unlucky on May 11, 2000. The 32-year-old would begin having difficulty breathing while walking up to the remote observatory and base. He would become increasingly sick over the next day and a half, eventually vomiting blood. That doctor, Robert Thompson, would note that Rodney had two needle marks on his arm but had no drugs in his system. That doctor would give him an antipsychotic medicine, which sedated him almost immediately. But Rodney would return to the doctor three more times, and on that third and final time, he came in complaining of hurting all over, and then less than two hours later, he was dead. The National Science Foundation 
would issue a statement saying that Rodney had, quote, apparently died of natural causes, but the specific cause of death had yet to be determined, end quote. Which sounds kind of weird that this 32-year-old just dropped over due to natural causes. This case would get a little bit of media attention, with some dubbing it as the first South Pole murder. Meanwhile, Rodney's body would be put on a sled and allowed to freeze for nearly six months over winter before it could be flown back to New Zealand, where America had a base for its Antarctic activities. Once there, an autopsy was done that established Rodney had died from methanol poisoning. But because of the jurisdiction issues in Antarctica being so complicated, the investigation was kind of slow. New Zealand would eventually take up the investigation, and they found that Rodney had ingested methanol almost certainly unknowingly. Suicide was quickly ruled out, as he had just entered a new relationship, and his very important academic work was almost completed, and he had no financial issues. Hindering the case is the National Science Foundation and Raytheon, who have not been very cooperative. They wouldn't even tell New Zealand detectives who was on the base. They said they had no report that contained the full roster on site, which, you know, sounds like BS. The lead investigator would finally get the details of the 49 people that were there, but only 13 of them replied back to the investigator's request, most likely afraid of losing their coveted position. Strangely, in September 2008, the report from the investigation was released, and it basically said they could not find any evidence of a prank gone wrong, nor foul play, nor suicide. This has obviously led to lots of speculation. One theory in this case is that Rodney, who was a huge drinker, may have purposely drank the methanol in hopes of getting a high and substitute for not having an alcoholic drink. However, that was looked at by detectives, and they did not believe that was what had happened because there was ample supplies of liquor on the base. Another theory was that Marks had been poisoned by a bottle of alcohol which he brought to the base. It's thought that this unusual looking bottle that had Portuguese writing and a picture of a shrimp on the label could have been purchased somewhere in Southeast Asia, where travelers are known to get poisoned by tainted alcohol. The doctor in all this, Robert Thompson, is odd too, as he had a tool available to him that would have helped diagnose Rodney's methanol poisoning, but he didn't use it because it was not working properly since the battery was dead, although it would still turn off and on. He would just have to calibrate it each time, but instead of, you know, turning it on, calibrating it once, and leaving it on, or even fixing it. Thompson declined to do this. In fact, the machine was said to be easy to repair. Thompson also had internet access and a satellite phone where he could have reached out to other doctors. However, he claimed that neither of these were working either. And most bizarre of all, Thompson would do one interview only about this incident, and in 2009, he disappeared. Rosalind Ballingall. Rosalind Ballingall was born on December 30th, 1949 in Lusaka, Northern Rhodesia, now known as Zambia. Her family would eventually move to a wealthy suburb in Johannesburg after her father took a senior executive job at Barlow Rand Mines. It was here that Rosalind would enroll in the University of Cape Town in 1969. She would pursue a diploma in speech and drama. She was six foot tall with long reddish blonde hair and piercing blue green eyes, which obviously would help her as an actress. During her time at Cape Town, she would live at a few different places, but one that sticks out is when she moved to Coburn Street in DeWaterconk Greenpoint. This was known as a gray area in the apartheid zone city, meaning that residents included anyone and everyone, from poor white Africaners, Muslims, to illegal immigrants. A lot of the more liberal students would visit and reside there, who would also become known for its unconventional lifestyle such as more open attitudes about drug use and sex. It's here that Rosalind would find herself. And although her mother visited her once and said it was not the best part of town, she did say Rosalind seemed happy. But that August in 1969, Rosalind's teachers would begin to notice that she became deeply depressed. Some of this was due to her roles in the university productions. Earlier that year, she had landed a major role in a ballet, leading her to be publicly praised by the producer. But months after this, she was reduced to minor roles, possibly because the drama department was giving the starring roles to upperclassmen. Because of this, Rosalind lost faith in her acting ability, and that, combined with her drug use, which she had attained when she started hanging out 
with people in the counterculture movement, aka hippies. Two of her acquaintances, Tanya Geffen and Sascha Sergeev, who was a Bob Dylan-esque Ukrainian musician who invited her to a retreat in Fisenthuk, located in the Nazna forest. This again, was not unusual during this time period, especially in the US and Europe. She would arrive on August 11th and had lunch with her neighbors. It's here they would begin to discuss the book of revelations and end time prophecies. And some rumors state that they explored the topic up until the evening during a drug session. Regardless, Rosalind would wake up the next morning, August 12th, dressed only in a jersey, jeans, and sandals, and walked out the door with a Bible in her hand. She would tell her friends that she was going for a walk. From here, two staff members would speak to Rosalind, and she came up and asked them for directions to a church. She would then leave the premises, and the gardener would see Rosalind walk across the lawn and enter a grove of trees and disappear into the forest. By that night, Rosalind had still not returned, and her friends began to worry. Although they knew she had a tendency to go off by herself at times, she always returned. They contemplated calling the police, but assumed there was no point in the middle of the night, which was a bad idea, obviously. Only more so, because a rain would come through, making it hard for the search dogs to pick up a scent. The search was made further complicated by the vast thick undergrowth in the forest, which made some areas impassable. They began to wonder how Rosalind could have made it through. They then speculated that perhaps she was walking around aimlessly, maybe due to drug use. The search was called off two weeks later, when not one clue was found. So what happened? Theories ranged from getting injured in the forest, or committing suicide, or possibly even foul play. Yet, no remains being found is only fueled speculation. There were rumors that she was involved in a love triangle, or was even pregnant and murdered by the father of the baby. One other possibility that was looked at was that she had actually not went into the forest at all, but made her way to the National Road about four miles away and hitchhiked somewhere. There were actually numerous sightings of a woman that looked like her along the highway for a period of time afterwards. Did she go somewhere else and start a new life? We will probably never know. Rutger Hell. This is a scary one here. On October 24th, 2013, on a dark rainy morning, 22-year-old Rutger Hell of Queenstown, New Zealand, was driving down State Highway 6 near Lake Kawaya as Rutger and his partner, Danielle Euler, were traveling alone. They would see a white four-wheel drive truck or utility vehicle coming down the other side of the road when all of a sudden, a beige-colored object about the size of a tissue box or brick was rocketing towards Rucker's vehicle. This object crashed through the windshield, hit Rucker in the head, then exited through the rear window. Danielle would quickly grab the wheel and lift Rucker's foot off the accelerator, and the car ran off the road into the ditch. Rucker was pronounced dead at the scene. But what's even crazier is this object was never found or identified. In spite of a massive search for it, Danielle would say, that the item came from somewhere between the driver's window and the back of the vehicle. Crash investigators at the scene also identified tire marks on the road that were consistent with another vehicle slowing and doing a U-turn before turning around and leaving. The wound left on Rucker was described as unusual. It was semi-circular and about 80 millimeters in diameter. Investigators concluded that it was possibly stainless steel, man-made, and had a sandpaper rough surface and was coated in soil, although a U.S. Army materials and manufacturing specialist would contradict this and stated that it was unlikely to be steel or any high-density material. He also concluded that it had a reasonably sharp corner of about 5 mm radius. They also found that it most likely slid off the deck of the vehicle and did not disintegrate on impact, but it was just somehow lost, and without the other driver coming forward, We'll probably never know what it was that killed him. Saladin. Saladin is best known for his campaigns against the Christian Crusader states in the Holy Land, including the capture of Jerusalem in 1187. He fought against several Crusader leaders, including King Richard the Lionheart of England, and he became renowned for his chivalry and military skill. Despite his military successes, Saladin was known for his generosity and piety, and he was respected by both Muslims and Christians. He is remembered as a hero and symbol to Muslim resistance. 
and thanks to pretty good record keeping from this time period, we actually know quite a bit about his life. However, one thing historians don't know is what Saladin died from. We know that on March 4th, 1193, he died in Damascus, and it was recorded that he died from fever. But fever from what? Historical accounts record that Saladin was hit with a two-week series of sweating attacks, a fever, and headaches. He was weak, restless, and lost his appetite. His doctors bled him and gave him enemas, which you know, didn't work. Eventually, he was unable to sip water and began sweating even more profusely. He would then fall into a coma and died 14 days after the symptoms started. So what was this malady? It's hard for historians and doctors to say because there's essentially no information recorded about it other than what I just stated. In 2010, Philip Miskalyak of the University of Maryland School of Medicine suggested that he died from tuberculosis, but other experts dispute this because the most visible symptom with tuberculosis is breathing issues, which was not recorded in Saladin's account. Neither were periods of chills and shivers, which rules out malaria. Others have suggested typhoid fever, which was caused by a bacteria known to affect people in the Middle East at the time, but with so little info available, it will probably never be known. Sea Peoples One of the more interesting mysteries from ancient history, that is, just who were the Sea Peoples? But before we look at that, let's look at exactly what they did and why they are famous. Or should I say, infamous. The Sea Peoples were a confederation of seafaring raiders and pirates who were active in the Eastern Mediterranean region during the Late Bronze Age, around the 12th century BC. They are best known for their invasions and attacks on the coastal regions of the Levant, Anatolia, and Egypt. The Sea Peoples first appeared in historical records in the 13th century BC and were active for several centuries. They were known for their naval prowess and their use of chariots in battle. Their raids and invasions contributed to the collapse of several major Bronze Age civilizations, including the Hittites and the Mycenaeans. However, their attacks on Egypt were repelled by Pharaoh Ramses III in a famous battle known as the Battle of the Delta, which marked the beginning of the end of the Sea People's power in the region. With all that being said, just who were they? We know that they were not a single ethnic or cultural group, but rather a diverse coalition of seafaring peoples, including the Philistines, the Jekker, the Shekelesh, the Dinyan, the Pelset, and the Wishesh, among others. Their origins are not entirely clear, but it is believed that they may have came from various regions in the Mediterranean, including the Aegean, the Balkans, and the Black Sea. And since this is a pretty famous one, and there are a ton of great videos that really go in deep on this mystery, I will move on. Shotgun Man From January 1910 until March 26, 1911, a spree killer and assassin known only as Shotgun Man would kill 15 Italian immigrants in Chicago, Illinois. Four of those happened within three days in March 1911, mainly in an area called Death Corner, a notoriously violent Italian immigrant neighborhood. The murders were believed to be connected to a gang of extortionists called the Black Hand, who employed Shotgun Man. And it was in front of the grocery store on Oak Street that a stairwell led into the basement entrance to the store, and then to a runway that connected to other alleys. At the bottom of that stairwell, Shotgun Man would wait. Then as soon as his victim came into view, he would fire off a load of buckshot, discard his weapon, and flee down the runway. And although the killings were witnessed by dozens of bystanders, the Chicago police were never able to identify him probably because the man was well known throughout the Italian community. It's thought because of the influence of the Black Hand, bystanders were hesitant to turn him in. And that's pretty much it to this one. No one knows the fate of Shotgun Man. He seemed to vanish right before Prohibition, as the extortion operations by the Black Hand had faded away by the end of the decade. However, a lot of the story has become mired in legend. True, there were 15 murders in that area for that year and they were committed by shotgun. But, police at that time were certain that these were all individual murders that although might have been related to organized crime, wasn't necessarily connected to the shotgun man. Crime researchers now believe that the so-called shotgun man was really only involved in the four murders that happened in that three-day period, while all the others were not connected. 
A silent man. This is a strange one here. In the coastal city of Swansea, which is located in Wales, a man known as Silent Man has been going into the middle of traffic and just standing there, not saying a word. This has caused several traffic jams, and the man has been arrested more than once. 51-year-old David Hampson, over a period of seven years, would randomly stand in the same spot on the same road, which was in front of a police station. He was eventually arrested in 2017 and was sentenced to three years in jail and maybe not strangely, refused to say anything in his defense. As soon as he was released, he went to the same spot again, right outside the Swansea Central Police Station. He was arrested again, and that was 2020, and he was eventually sentenced to three and a half years starting in August 2022. He has never voiced any reasoning for doing this, but police have confirmed that he can't speak, he just refuses to. They also strangely noted, he is a very polite man. This one is not too mysterious. Most people seem to think he is either mentally ill or, considering he is doing it in front of a police station, may be homeless and just trying to get arrested so he can have some shelter and warm food. Sleepy Hollow Killer This next mystery takes place in South Africa during the late 90s when several women were found near the N3 highway who had been sexually assaulted and then strangled with their own panties. Most of the women were thought to be sex workers who operated in Peter Maritzburg. No one was able to identify the victims, but seven of the bodies would eventually be exhumed in 2001 in an attempt to try and identify them, yet it led to nothing. The killer would go quiet after his attacks in the late 90s, but he made a return in 2007 when three more bodies were found near the N3 highway vicinity. The first, near a high school. The second, near a mall. And the last was found in a town called Hilton. Just like the other victims, they had been sexually assaulted and strangled with their panties. The only difference was this time, they were severely burned after death. And bizarrely, there were other victims who showed the same exact signatures that were found over 500 miles away. In total, he killed at least 13 but it's possible that he killed many more. And unfortunately, there's not a lot about this case. That's the flip side of obscure mysteries. Sometimes, we have hardly nothing to go on. There was one guy that was arrested for a murder during all this, and there was an attempt to link him to the Sleepy Hollow killings, but they were able to rule him out. And after that, it just kinda ends. If there's a suspect, they never said so publicly. Springfield 3. On June 6th, 1992, 19-year-old Susie Streeter and 18-year-old Stacy McCall had just graduated Kickapoo High School in Springfield, Missouri. The two girls would be seen the next morning, June 7th at 2 a.m., leaving the last graduation party that they had attended that evening. The two had planned to spend the night with their friend Janelle Kirby, but when they seen her house was too crowded, they left and opted to go to Susie's home and spend the night there with Susie's mother, Cheryl Levitt. Cheryl was a 47-year-old single mom who worked as a cosmetologist. The following day, at around 9 a.m., Janelle showed up at Cheryl and Susie's home. They were supposed to go to the water park that day, and the two girls were supposed to have met Janelle at her home. So when they didn't show, she would go to pick them up. And when she arrived, she seen each of the women's cars outside. She would eventually go to the door and found it unlocked, so she would enter. Inside, there was no sign of Susie Stacy or Cheryl, although their Yorkshire Terrier was inside the home and he seemed agitated. While standing there, surveying the scene wondering what to do, the phone would ring. Janelle would answer it and stated that it was a strange and disturbing call where a male voice made sexual innuendos. She hung up and immediately called back, making the sexual remarks a second time, and she again hung up. Even weirder on the front porch, the glass lamp shade to the porch light had been shattered, though the bulb itself was not. Janelle's boyfriend would innocently help to sweep up the broken glass, not knowing he was destroying potential evidence. Janelle would leave the strange scene and go home. But several hours later, Stacy's mother Janice would get worried after many failed attempts to reach her daughter by phone. When she walked in, she would see all three women's purses sitting on the floor of the living room and also saw her daughter's clothing neatly folded from the night before. She also seen Susie and Cheryl's cigarettes that were left behind. 
Janice would frantically call the police from the home to report the three missing. While waiting, she would also check the phone's answering machine, in which she stated she heard a strange message. The police would get to hear the message too, but it would end up being accidentally erased. By the time Janice had called the police, it had been 16 hours since the women were last seen, and detectives estimated that 10 to 20 worried friends and family members had entered the home looking for the three, totally corrupt in the crime scene, but they investigated the best they could and found no sign of a struggle, minus the busted porch light shade. A massive search began and found nothing, and in the time since, police have logged over 5,000 tips, given a ton of polygraphs, and still, nothing. As far as leads and suspects, well, one potential lead ended up being lost when a man called America's Most Wanted Hotline to report information about the disappearance. But when the switchboard operator transferred the call to the Springfield detectives, they got disconnected. The police have stated he had prime knowledge of the abductions, and they begged him to call back, but he never did. There was also a sighting of this green Dodge van that occurred on the day the women went missing. Supposedly, this van was driven by a terrified looking woman that looked like Susie, while an unseen male told her, quote, don't do anything stupid, end quote. There were actually a couple more witnesses that would report similar sightings. As far as suspects go, there's only one that really garnered interest. That is convicted kidnapper and thief Robert Cox, who has toyed with police over the years, making statements like, he knows that they are dead and he will reveal all after his mother dies. He was in Springfield at the time and he knew Stacy through her father. I've seen mixed reports they say he is still a suspect, while some sources state that investigators no longer believe he is a viable suspect, so I'm not sure which it is. Susie's dying. During the 70s and 80s in the United Kingdom, a peculiar set of rumors would begin to swirl. These rumors stated that if you went to a public phone box and dialed a specific number, on the other end, you would hear a woman's strangely monotone voice saying repeatedly, quote, Help me. Help me. Susie's dying, end quote. Over and over and over, as if it was a recording playing back at you. This number, well, it varied in different tellings, but the most often told version was 20202020. This mystery spanned decades, and even now, people wonder what the truth is. Did this number and message actually exist? And if so, why? Looking back, the first detailed account that brought people's attention to this mystery came in 2000 by a man named Rob Dickinson and he would state the following, quote, back around 1975 when I was nine, some of the kids I knocked around with insisted we all pile into the nearest phone box to hear a spooky message. By dialing a number, I think it was made up of zeros, twos, and ones, and without needing to insert two pence, a woman speaking in curiously monotone voice would be heard saying, Help me, help me, Susie's dying, over and over. Some of the lads said she sometimes said, help me, help me, Susie's drowning, always in the same slow, seemingly bored tone of voice. Was it some weird engineer's test signal? Hence, no money needed, end quote. Three other accounts would verify Rob's story, and from them, we know that the phone boxes around the town of Burnley, up north in Lancashire, is where the calls were made. These four accounts make up the official most detailed accounts of this weird mystery. And where did they come from? Well, it actually came out of a book called It Happened to Me, Real Life Tales of the Paranormal, Volume 1. The stories in there came from letters sent to a magazine called 40 in Times, which focused on reports of the odd, mysterious, and unexplained. And since three of those letters were sent out during the 70s at different dates, with similar details, plus Rob's recounting of the events in 2000. It had to be real, right? Well, after this mystery spread a little bit more and then got rolled up into some creepy pasta, it seems that more than a few accounts online also verified this weird phone message. Of course, it's the internet, and I'm sure a lot of these stories were just fabricated, but some of them seem to be pretty legit. So what was happening? It appears that this was some kind of message meant for the telephone company repairman to test with, and someone figured it out, or a telephone employee leaked it out. But it becomes something of a creepy legend. But there's still one other mystery here 
why make such a creepy message? Why not just do a standard testing one, two, three? Well, according to one theory, it seems that it didn't actually say, help me, Susie's dying. Instead, it said, hold please, user dialing. But because of the poor quality of the recording, it was misinterpreted. Another less believed theory is that it did say Susie's dying, but it was some type of emergency response test. I guess for first responders or something. Tamil Bell. In 1836, British missionary William Colenso would make an interesting discovery in the Northland region of New Zealand. While near Wangarei, the local Maori women were boiling potatoes in a peculiar looking pot. That pot, which was really a bell, was about 6.5 inches high and 6 inches across, and it bore an inscription. That inscription would later be identified as Tamil, and Tamil is a script used by Tamil speakers in India, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia, and it read, Mahoyden Bucks Ships Bell. The bell was thought to be about 500 years old, meaning that it was created around the 14th century, although some archaeologists dispute this and claim that it was most likely made in the 17th or 18th century. But the mystery, how in the world did this bell end up way down in New Zealand? The Maori women told Colenso that it had been with them for generations and that their ancestors found it in the roots of a tree that had toppled in the storm. Colenso was intrigued, so he traded a cast iron pot for the bell. From what historians can find, there was no contact with either of these two peoples. That's why it has become known as an out-of-place artifact, but there are a few theories which try to explain it. Of course, there's the obvious one, that the ancient Tamil seafarers had knowledge of Australia and Polynesia and were trading there, but again, there's no record of it. Another theory that has been proposed is that it was dropped on shore by a Portuguese ship whose sailors had picked it up in India, and following that line of thought, a number of Indian vessels had been captured by Europeans during this period, and it's possible that the bell might have belonged to a wrecked vessel that was cast away on New Zealand. Another theory was that a well-traveled sailor picked it up as a souvenir from a South Asian port and somehow lost it on the North Island of New Zealand. However, a more boring and likely theory is that it was brought over by a missionary or sailor before who then traded it with the Maori. Technological Singularity This mystery refers to the unknown and unpredictable consequences that could arise from the development of artificial intelligence that surpasses human intelligence. While some experts predict that the emergence of superintelligent machines will lead to unprecedented advances in human knowledge, others warn of the potential dangers and risk associated with creating machines that may eventually become uncontrollable or even hostile to humans. The mystery lies in the fact that once these machines become smarter than humans, it becomes impossible for humans to fully understand their thought processes and decision-making mechanisms. This makes it difficult to predict their actions and behavior and raises questions about how they will interact with humans and the world around them. Moreover, the growth of technological capabilities that could arise from the singularity could have far-reaching impacts on society, economies, politics, and even the nature of human existence. For example, superintelligent machines could solve complex problems that humans have not been able to solve, but they could also disrupt entire industries and create significant job losses. They could also potentially change the course of human evolution or lead to the creation of new forms of life that we cannot even imagine. The Crater In Pukarau, Southland, New Zealand, lies a land feature known as the Crater that is not really known as a crater. What do I mean? Well, that's the mystery in this one. What exactly caused this formation of land that looks like, well, a crater, known to the locals as Landslip Hill? The name indicated what is believed to have really caused this weird formation when a big, unstable hillside slumped into the earth. But a lot of people refuse to accept this explanation and offer up others, the main one being that it is an impact crater from an asteroid or comet that hit the earth around 1200 AD. Most of this is drawn from some Maori stories that claim that raging fires fell from the sky 
accompanied by winds and upheavals in the earth, while others cite that the area itself, which measures 2,000 by 3,000 feet wide and over 400 feet deep, and surrounded by a zone of fallen trees 130 feet to 260 feet wide, and trees that date from eight centuries ago. However, archaeologists have searched the area multiple times and can find no evidence of a meteor impact, and they also dispute the translations of the Maori legends that indicate an asteroid hit. But there are even crazier theories. One even claims that on June 19th, 1178, which is very specific, seven UFOs exploded there simultaneously, making the crater. But most likely, it's just a result of an unstable hillside. The Great Attractor. The Great Attractor is a gravitational anomaly located in the direction of the Centaurus constellation that exerts a strong gravitational pull on nearby galaxies. The mystery surrounding it lies in the fact that its exact nature and location are still not well understood. It was first discovered in the 1970s when astronomers noticed that many galaxies in our local universe appeared to be moving towards a point in space located in the direction of the Centaurus constellation. This suggested the presence of a massive object exerting a strong gravitational force. However, it is hidden behind the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, making it difficult to observe directly. Astronomers have used various techniques, such as mapping the distribution of galaxies and measuring the speeds and directions of their motion to try to determine the nature and location of the Great Attractor. One theory in this is that it is a supercluster of galaxies that is much more massive than our own local group of galaxies. Another theory is that it could be a massive black hole, perhaps even larger than the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy. The Secret The Secret is a treasure hunt that was created by writer Byron Price back in 1982. The hunt involved a search for 12 treasure boxes in which the clues were provided for in a book written by Price, which also was called The Secret. These boxes are buried in secret locations in cities across the U.S. and Canada that symbolically represent events and peoples that played significant roles in North American history. And anyone who finds one of these boxes were able to exchange it with the author for a precious gem. However, after Price died in 2005, his estate took up the responsibility of honoring the terms of the deal, and over 40 years after its debut, only three of the 12 boxes have ever been found. And considering Price kept no record of the treasure locations before his death, it's possible they'll never be found. The book contains 12 images and 12 verses, and an image must be linked to a verse. With that information, they can then use it to find the treasure. The first was found in Chicago in 1983 with the verse where M and B are set in stone. The second was found in Cleveland in 2004 with the verse beneath two countries. The third was found in Boston in 2019 with the verse, if Thucydides is north of Xenophon. To explain how all three were found would simply take too long, so I'll just use Cleveland as an example to kind of show you how it works. On the image provided for the one in Cleveland, there is a centaur holding this cup, and this cup was found to be an exact match for the fountain in the central courtyard of the Italian Cultural Garden and the terminal tower can be found in an upside-down silhouette. The ball and triangle refer to Euclid, father of geometry, and Euclid Avenue intersects Martin Luther King Drive, which runs along the western slope of the Greek cultural garden where the treasure was found. Adding to the Greek clues was the centaur itself, which is a mythical Greek creature. But how did they find Cleveland? That actually goes back to the shape to the left of the monument, which looks a lot like the highway map to Ohio. As you can see, this is very well thought out. The other nine that have not been found at least had the cities identified. Those are as follows. San Francisco, Charleston, Roanoke, St. Augustine, New Orleans, Houston, Montreal, Milwaukee, and New York. The hunt kind of faded from public consciousness until 2019 when Josh Gates did an episode of Expedition Unknown that did a reenactment of finding the one in Boston in 2019. This caused the book to explode in sales, and now there are tons of treasure hunters across the country looking for these. Yet, it's going to be difficult 
finding the remaining nine. The Sun Safe of Unpublished Photos, Stories, and Videos The Sun is a British tabloid that has been in circulation since September 1964. It became a daily newspaper in 2012, and in 2014, it would become infamous for its phone hacking scandal in which six of its staff were on trial accused of corrupting public officials, and it's during this trial that the deputy news editor, Ben O'Driscoll, claimed that the newspaper had a seven-foot-high safe filled with over 30 years' worth of unpublished photographs, stories, and videos from people in public life. The phone hacking incident itself goes back to 2005 when it was determined that the royal family's phone had been hacked. This led to the discovery that voicemails of various public people had been getting hacked. And as far as the safe goes, which is the center of this mystery, O'Driscoll would state that they had been storing these stories on celebrities since the 80s and that they were confidential and mostly featured members of the British Parliament, celebrities, royal family members, and other notable figures. The stories were looked at carefully and an editor would determine which stories would be published out of public interest and most of these stories would be deemed not worthy of public interest and would be locked away from prying eyes. The material is rumored to be eye-popping, containing revelations about certain high-profile individuals that if published would significantly increase the sun's circulation. However, they have refused to spill the dirt haphazardly. So what exactly is in this safe, nicknamed the Black Museum? Not surprisingly, speculation ranges from compromising photos of the royal family all the way to evidence of potential crimes. Peter Jukes of Byline Times has stated that the editor of The Sun from 2003 to 2009, Rebecca Brooks, who was also a key figure of the phone hacking scandal, supposedly revealed to sources stories about sexual abuse from certain key prominent figures. He also cited a book written by former News of the World journalist Graham Johnson, which said there was evidence of possible crimes being hidden in the safe. Of course, this is all speculation, and what remains hidden behind the safe is still unknown. Timothy Pitson You might not be familiar with the name Timothy Pitson, but I bet you probably know his story. On May 11, 2011, six-year-old Timothy Pitson was dropped off at his kindergarten class in Deora, Illinois by his father James Pitson. His mother, Amy Fry Pitson, would then check him out between 8.10 and 8.15 a.m. citing a family emergency, which did not exist. She would then drop her vehicle off at a repair shop at 10 a.m. An employee there would then drive Amy and Timothy over to the Brookfield Zoo and drop them off. They would then return to her vehicle at 3 p.m. and drove it to Key Lime Cove Resort in Gurney where they spent the night. The next day, they would drive to Kalahari Resort in Wisconsin where they were spotted on security footage in the checkout line at 10 a.m. After this, the two would vanish. The next day, between 12 p.m. and 1.30 p.m. on May 13th, Amy would telephone her mother and brother-in-law telling them that she and Timothy were okay. Cell phone records showed that the calls were made from Sterling, Illinois, about 80 miles away. By that night, Amy was seen alone on security cameras at Family Dollar in Winnebago, where she bought a pen, notepaper, and envelopes. At 8 p.m., she would be sighted at Sullivan's Food Store again. She was alone. That night, at 11.15 p.m., she checked into the Rockford Inn, and sometime that night, or early the next morning, she took her life by slashing her neck and wrist and then overdosing on antihistamines. Her body was found at 12.30 p.m. the following day, along with a note. In the note, she apologized for the mess that she had created and also explained that Timothy would never be found but was safe with people who would care for him. Investigators would state the knife that Amy used to kill herself had her blood only. However, they did find a concerning amount of blood in her car that belonged to Timothy. But family members told detectives that it was likely caused by a nosebleed that Timothy had sustained in the car earlier that month. The location of Amy's vehicle was of interest too. The SUV was visibly dirty and had soil, tall grass, and weeds stuck to the undercarriage where it was finally located. Forensic testing on the plant and sediment indicated that it stopped for a time 
on a gravel area just off an asphalt road that had been treated with glass road making beads. It was then backed into a grassy meadow or field that contained Queen Anne's lace and black mustard plants and would have been near trees. Amazingly, they could also determine that a pond or stream was possibly close by. Investigators were certain she had planned this for months and would explain why she took two unplanned trips to the area just a few months earlier. Authorities initially believed that she really had taken Timothy to people that could care for him, largely based on the fact that his car seat was missing. Unfortunately, that turned up to be at his grandmother's house, and detectives started to fear the worst, although Timothy's family still believes that he is alive and that Amy would have never hurt him, and maybe backing up this claim, investigators found that Amy had been using 11 different Yahoo accounts in correspondence with several people, possibly couples looking to adopt, but she had deleted all the emails and they were completely unrecoverable, so it's possible he is still alive. In fact, one theory is that she gave him to an Amish family. However, the morning that all this transpired, James and Amy had a bitter argument. After James had found she had been talking to her ex-husband and had planned a little rendezvous with him, James told her she had to pick him or her ex, but if she went to her ex, he would get full custody of Timothy due to her multiple suicide attempts in the past. This was the catalyst that set things off, and considering her suicide note said several negative things to James, well, it's led many to believe that Timothy did not survive. Unknown man. In 2013, a man in Toronto was arrested for committing over $400,000 in fraud. This man claimed to be Herman Emmanuel Fankham, a French national living in Montreal. When the Canadian authorities contacted France officials, it was found out that the man's passport was fake and they had no record of him. Further investigation revealed the man appeared in 11 other countries under several more aliases. He refused to cooperate and refused to answer any questions about his identity or past. The Canadian government wasn't able to deport him, leaving him in limbo in a max security prison. He was then scheduled to testify publicly in 2019 before the Immigration and Refugee Board, but at the last minute, the hearing was made private, which is strange, because under Canadian law, these hearings are to take place in public unless there are extraordinary circumstances. Fankham did appear in Montreal on a flight from Cuba on October 28, 2012. That much is known. He also handed over a French passport and said this wasn't his first visit, as he had came six months earlier and left a week before, and he was supposedly returning to go to the wake of a friend's sister. He was allowed to stay for 10 days, which he did not abide by. After being arrested for the scam he was running, he would refuse to meet Canadian Border Services Agency and refuse to have his photograph taken or given fingerprints. He has also refused to appear at his detention reviews, as well as not meeting with French diplomats after insisting that he needed to speak with them. Authorities have pretty much narrowed down his home country as Cameroon, since it is a French-speaking nation, as well as being where his first identities have been traced to, especially the name Buon Emmanuel Febble, which many believe is the man's real name, but he might also be from any of the other French-speaking nations in Africa, such as Tanzania, Republic of the Congo, Gabon, Morocco, and Algeria, among others. But why is he doing this? It seems the biggest theory is that he would rather stay in a Canadian prison than go back to where he came from, obviously, right? But why? Well, no one's sure, but it is odd that his trail seemed to pick up in the mid-2000s, around the same time that the terrorist group Boko Haram come to prominence. Did he do something to cross them? Or was he wrapped up in a large criminal organization from the region whom he fears? Maybe the two accomplices that he got arrested with blame him. Another theory is that he might be wanted in Cameroon and once he is deported, would have to do time in a Cameroonian prison, which would be hellish to say the least. Finally, another theory is maybe he has some type of mental illness and truly believes he has been kidnapped by the Canadian government. What's really odd about all this, though, is when Canada started reaching out to other nations about this man's identity, Germany responded with, quote, We are not permitted to disclose it, end quote, which kind of indicates 
he has some kind of importance. Is it because they are investigating a much larger case? Or could he be a spy? West Mesa Bone Collector On February 2nd, 2009, a woman walking her dog in West Mesa, New Mexico would make an awful discovery. When she came across a human bone, she would call the police, who obviously came out to look. And I imagine, they were surprised when this one bone would lead to finding the remains of 11 women. These victims, aged 15 to 32, were mostly Hispanic. Most of them were also involved with drugs and sex work, and all vanishing sometime between 2001 and 2005. The victims are as follows. Jamie Barella, 15. Monica Condalaria, 22. Victoria Chavez, 24. Selania Edwards, 15. Cinnamon Elks, 32. Doreen Marquez, 24. Julie Nieto, 24. Veronica Romero, 28. Evelyn Salazar, 27, and Michelle Valdez, 22. Investigators would turn to satellite photos, which confirmed that the last victim to be buried happened in 2005. Selania Edwards was the only victim who came from out of state. She was a 15-year-old runaway from Lawton, Oklahoma. Investigators do believe that all of the victims were placed here by the same person or persons, but what is even more eerie, they don't know if it is the work of a serial killer, or if it is the dumping ground by a sex trafficking ring suspected to exist in the area. Although, law enforcement have had several persons of interest, there's never been a suspect named, at least publicly. Of these persons of interest, one man named Fred Reynolds was a pimp and knew one of the victims and had photos of other missing sex workers. However, he died in 2009. Another man, named Lorenzo Montoya, lived less than three miles from the burial site, and in 2006, there were dirt trails leading to it from his trailer park. He had been arrested in the past for attacks on sex workers. He had apparently also talked to others about killing women and burying them in West Mesa. And in December of 2006, he actually strangled a teenage sex worker to death at his trailer. When her boyfriend slash pimp found out, he killed Lorenzo and the killing stopped after that. But, in 2014, a code case from the 80s was resolved that may have been linked to the West Mesa killings. Joseph Blee had been breaking into the homes of 13 to 15 year old girls and sexually assaulting them. DNA from one of those assaults was kept and tested in 2010, eventually leading to his arrest. They would then connect him to the killing of another sex worker, and he also told his cellmate that he had hired some of the West Mesa victims, and he called them trashy. So as you can see, multiple persons of interest. As far as the sex trafficking ring theory, it's theorized the people involved in this ring would go to regularly scheduled events with a lot of people, like the state fair, and abduct women there. Yet, why they decided to get rid of these 11 women, investigators have not said. The ring is believed to operate in the southwest, southern, and western U.S., with cities like Vegas, El Paso, and Denver. Going by this theory, the FBI and Albuquerque Police Department both have received Crime Stoppers tips that led them to a military special forces suspect from El Salvador. His last name is reported to be Coda, and that's pretty much all that's been released about this suspect. The case is still being worked, and police are still keeping things close to the vest. Why Dinosaurs Died Out Even though most scientists agree, the dinosaurs were most likely killed out by an asteroid hitting the Earth. There are still aspects of this event that are not fully understood. One ongoing debate is the extent to which the impact alone caused the extinction, or if there were other contributing factors. Some researchers propose that massive volcanic eruptions, which occurred around the same time, may have also played a role in that extinction event. These eruptions released enormous amounts of lava and gases, potentially leading to climate change and environmental disruptions. Another early theory stated that small animals were eating so many dinosaur eggs that the population become unsustainable. Some even speculate that a plague was responsible, or starvation. It was most likely several things. William Tyrell On September 11th, 2014, a three-year-old William Tyrell and his foster parents, along with his five-year-old sister, traveled about four hours from Sydney 
to visit his grandmother in Kendall, New South Wales, Australia, to visit his foster grandmother. Her house was on Benaroon Drive and was directly across from the Bush Road across from Kendall State Forest. Between 10 and 10.25 a.m. on September 12th, William and his sister were playing hide-and-seek in the front and backyard, while his foster mother and foster grandmother were sitting outside watching them. His foster mom would then go inside to make a cup of tea, and she became worried when she had not heard him for about five minutes. So she walked outside to take a look, and he was gone. It's then they would begin to search the yard and house. His foster dad showed up shortly after, as he had been in Lakewood on business. He would go to help with the search, going door to door. By 1036, the family had called authorities to report him missing. His foster mother would tell investigators the last thing she heard was William imitating a tiger's roar while he ran towards the side of the home and then it went silent and he vanished. Hundreds of emergency responders searched for him as well as volunteers. Motorcycles and helicopters were brought into aid too. By that night, 200 volunteers showed up, combing the rugged terrain. Dogs were brought in, but were only able to trace William's scent in the backyard. After five days of searching, not one sign of the child came up. An investigation would begin, and it found that two cars were seen by William's foster mother parked on the dead end road the morning of his disappearance. One was a white station wagon, and the other, an older gray sedan, both parked between two driveways on an acre lot of land. These vehicles were unknown and had never been seen by anyone in the neighborhood. The fact that these cars haven't been seen again, and the fact they had no reason to be there, has obviously interested the police. Reportedly, at 9 a.m. that morning, a green or gray sedan drove past the residence when William and his sister were riding bikes in the driveway. The car would then do a U-turn in the neighbor's driveway and went back out into the street. About an hour and a half later, another four-wheel drive was sighted driving around in the area and was later seen speeding down another street. Investigators were able to clear the Tyrell family of any involvement pretty quickly and stated that they believed an opportunistic stranger snatched the boy. And this is where the theory gets dark. It seems that police believed he was trafficked into a sex ring he could still be alive. In fact, there has been over 1,000 reported sightings of William. There are two persons of interest in this case. Both have been convicted of sex crimes against children, Paul Bickford and Tony Jones. These two losers actually met up on the day that William vanished. This disappearance has garnered a $1 million reward, the largest for any Australian missing person case in history. They have interviewed more than 1,000 people in connection with the case and named 690 persons of interest. As of now, the case seems to be heated up. In late 2021, the search around the Kendall area got intense. And in April 2022, William's foster mother was charged with giving false or misleading info about the boy's disappearance. But she was found not guilty that November. It should be noted here too that her husband was also charged with a similar offense. But even more suspiciously, they were both charged with assault of a child in their home. Supposedly, the unnamed foster mother hit one of the children with a wooden spoon. She denied this, but did admit the hitting and kicking the child. And at least one detective now says that in William's case, he believes that the foster mother knows where William is. In fact, one theory is William was playing high up on the balcony outside and fell to his death, only for the foster parents to cover it up. Woods Devil The Woods Devil or maybe even plural, devils, is a Sasquatch-like, or a group of Sasquatch-like, cryptids that are said to roam the woods of Coos County, New Hampshire, since the 1930s. They are described as being skinny, but still being Sasquatch-like. They are around 7 to 9 feet tall, and have shaggy tan gray hair. One unusual trait is that the cryptid uses trees to hide behind, especially if a human walks into the area, they will hide until the coast is clear. And if no trees are available, they stand perfectly still until it knows a person can see it. They are very elusive, said to be fast and nimble, possibly moving from behind one tree to the other. Outdoorsmen, hikers, and others alike have described hearing the screams of this creature echoing throughout the county. It's currently unknown if this cryptid is a subspecies of Bigfoot or if it's its own species. 
assuming they exist. Another theory is that it could be what is known as a hide behind, a nocturnal creature that is said to feed on humans and was blamed for the disappearances of early loggers in America. The sightings have been traced back to the 19th century, but it spiked during the 1970s. According to witnesses, you can almost walk into the creature before even realizing it's there. And that is all part 12 of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg Explained. And with that, we finally finished layer 4. I hope you guys have enjoyed it as much as I have.